Okay. What's up? Um, Happy New Year. It seems like we've, um, <laughs> we just celebrated last year, it seems like. Anyway, so Happy New Year again. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm going to do any New Year's resolutions this year. Um, it's been like the same one for the past five years, and it just hasn't gotten done. <laughs> so obviously it's not really working out too hot. I think I'm just going to... Um, just make it something I, I strive towards, but not really have a set time frame. Even though, I mean, a year is enough time to complete it. I just, I, I don't think I like that sort of constraint, you know. So, um, <clears throat> we'll see. <laughs> I have a tendency to procrastinate really bad. And um, so maybe that's uh, something I can work on. Anyway, I wanted to, okay, there's no city session. I'm uh, not really sure why I skipped. <laughs> um, anyway, what I was saying was um, I wanted to talk about migration patterns. Migration patterns, they provide um, a nice basis, a nice introduction to begin with. Um, and uh, you'll see why um, it's important as we move along in the series. Um, the video would deal with the history of slavery. Not necessarily worldwide slavery, um, but it will do, it will touch on slavery outside of, um, you know, African Holocaust. Okay. Um, just a little bit. And, um, and, and it's going to mainly focus on Europeans. Okay. <laughs> um, so whenever I get to this, this, this series is mostly going to deal with chattel slavery in America. Okay. I'll get to the other. Um, the other places like the Caribbean and South America and um, Asia dealing with some of the Arab countries over there and even East Asia if some of you guys didn't know like China China had us as, as um, slaves and stuff so um, but I won't be getting to that and and uh, you know I don't know when but I'll get to it but it won't be in this video this video you know like I said it's going to focus on the history of slavery as it relates to American slavery um, and it's also going to touch on a bit European slavery because that's important um, because a lot of times what you'll find is that white people will um, intentionally um, equate societal structures or systems so that they can justify the enslavement of African people because what that does is it says well hey you know what um, you know, we're just continuing you know something that was already prevalent and present in Africa you know what we're doing is just an extension of that even though that's a lie okay so we'll talk we'll, we'll touch on that um, the history of slavery we're going to begin with the differences between slavery and servitude I actually already have a video up dealing with African servitude uh, but um, which is actually really good in terms of subject matter that's covered uh, but I, but in this video I'm also going to give you information with European slavery and what was going on over there um, with them. So we'll begin with the difference the differences between slavery and servitude. Um, again, we'll discuss African societies, African perspectives um, versus Europeans' um, societal structures and systems, their their perspectives, you know, regarding uh, bondage. Okay. We'll also discuss. Um, you know, I'll give a detailed and chronological history of chattel slavery in America um, and its uh, derivative forms, including the neo peonage system and um, uh, sharecropping, okay, stuff like that. Uh, it's going to go from the 1400s to 1970s. I do believe there was one. I want to say there, there was a couple more, but I don't want to give out that information and, and I'm not sure, all right? So I know that there was one family um, who was still enslaved in the, in the 1970s. They, they didn't know that it ended. Crazy, right? It's crazy. Um, but I am going to research more and see if there were other families. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I want to say yes, but the probability of me being correct is low. <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, put it out there and then, you know, give wrong information. So I'm just going to check it. Um, let's see, we're going to deal with the process of slave catching. 
um, in particular where our ancestors came from, uh, why they came from those regions, and why they ended up in the regions they ended up in America. Okay, we will also talk about some of the major players um, in the slave catching and selling process. Just to kind of touch on those points, um, a lot of times um, certain regions in Africa were known for certain skill sets. Oh yeah, they didn't bring over people who didn't know what the hell they were doing. Okay, they didn't do that. That'd be stupid, <laughs> right? Because. So um, I don't know what happened. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why it skipped like that. But what I was saying was um, they didn't bring folks over um, who didn't know what they were doing. Okay, they didn't bring over people with no skills. So that's what I was saying. See, when when in the 1400s when all this began, uh, they were just coming up out of their second dark age. They had two dark ages: one in BC time, and one in AD time. Right? And they they were just coming up from under their dark age in AD time when they started slavery amongst us. So that's all I wanted to say. I don't know why I skipped like that, but okay. Who, come, who came from different regions in West Africa and they were taken to America and they were, um, you know, you know, they were moved into other regions in America for a particular um, uh, commodity. So one might be ironwork, some artisanal skills, another might be more focused on agriculture, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and the other part dealing with the major players um, deals with who was actually doing the uh, slave catching and selling. Okay. <laughs> when you are receiving input from white people, People in general, but in particular white people, uh, because they they have a they they, they have a uh, propensity to lie. They're liars, okay. And so you have to research everything they tell you and give you, and analyze critically, analyze and um, evaluate everything that they say, okay, and do, especially in regards to African history, okay, even with their own history. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's usually some underlying benefit, you know, to what they say. Okay. So it's never really the truth. You're never going to get the truth out of them. Not really. And so what they'll do a lot of times is they'll, they'll omit little things and, and twist meanings using nuance to flip things. In their favor so they can present things in a certain way so that people come away with a different conclusion than what you should be coming away with okay it's deceit it's a, it's a that's lying okay <laughs> and so let me give you an example there's a book called and I believe I have it in PDF format um, there's a book called uh, mini Thousands Gone by Ira Berlin. And let me give you an example of just what I talked about, about how they sneakily uh, lie, okay, and twist things in a way to, 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 to not really give you the truth. So let me see if I can find it. Um, I don't know if I have it open already, but let me see. Uh, <clears throat> um, where are you? Where are you? Here we go. I think I thought I have it on there. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, I think I have it up. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to really read this, um, but I, this highlighted part um, is important. I mean, the whole chapter is important, but this uh, this was really interesting to me. <laughs> I haven't really dug through this book. Um, even though it's a good book for the most part, um, you just gotta really have to watch out and really analyze and critique, you know, what's 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 being uh, presented. If you're not really aware of African slavery, and I know a lot of people aren't, because you know most most people just haven't researched it, don't have the time, um, and you know they've depended on the watered down bullshit that you get in school to carry you through. <laughs> adulthood in terms of understanding history which is terrible 
Um, but, you know, I know black folks, a lot of us, we just, I understand. We just trying to, you know, keep our head above the waters, a lot of us. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times we don't have enough time to really research it. But, you know, it's harmful to these children. It's harmful to these children to not do the research and to teach them to counteract the, you know, the indoctrination that they get in these schools. You know, you can't, you, you know, these schools are producing non-thinking children. Okay. That's what they're producing. They're producing robots. You know, it, it's nothing but rote learning. Shit you can easily memorize and then regurgitate. Nothing is being challenged. I think one of my, uh, I think, I think what I'm really, um, appreciative of is when I was growing up, I went to um, private schools mostly. Um, but when I was growing up, there was uh, a lot of, and it was a black school, there were black schools, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but when I was growing up, um, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on comprehension, understanding, reading, critical analysis. Uh, you know, I'm very thankful, that, thankful for that because, you know, but I was always a reader, but I was very thankful for that because you know it produced a thinking person you know you're not just gonna accept what's written you know some people who might read something like this they'll just read it and they won't really take the time to um uh research or or or, or uh, look up things so just take it as it is and regurgitate it <laughs> you know what i'm saying so anyway um these kids, it's unfortunate, especially these black children, they don't know anything. Jack shit. They don't know anything. Nothing. Very watered down. Look how they do Martin Luther King. <laughs> you know, they use them as a, also as a silent mechanism when, black, when they want black folks to shut up because they're feeling uncomfortable about racism being, you know, uh, talked about. Well, that's too, that's too bad. <laughs> That's too bad. Um, but what ends up happening is these kids, you know, um, they're learning to look up to white people. And I'm really condensing uh, the subject matter. I'm trying to make it as concise as possible. And I'm trying to get through this video. Um, <laughs> but, you know, these kids, they learn all, they learn this information. And the parents aren't counteracting what's being presented. They're not expanding their knowledge. They're not talking to them. And like I said, I understand black folks is just, you know, we're trying to, live above you know trying to trying to do what we need to do to survive you know the majority of us so i understand they don't have enough time you know there's just there's just the time just isn't there but you're gonna have to try you're gonna t you're going to have to try 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 because these kids are being crushed they're being crushed and so you know imagine i mean you know you sitting in there as a black child Okay, you sit in there as a black child in a setting, in a school setting as a black child, where all the teachers don't look like you. None of them look like you. And you're learning about white folks. The emphasis is on white folks. And your history isn't interweaved into, into any subject matter. It's just, it's a standalone subject for, you know, dedicated to a particular month. <laughs> Even though it's the fabric of the entire country. It's what shaped the entire goddamn country. It is what built the, the America. And so, the, in the modern world. Uh, but anyway, so you're sitting here in class, you know, you're not, you know, you're sitting here learning about all these white folks. <laughs> As a black child. That's, that's devastating. And what happens on an unconscious level, you begin to absorb internalized hatred internalized racism and because they these schools function on um, this farce of an ideal called colorblindness and diversity because your self-worth isn't being cared for neither at home in the sense of who you are Okay, and neither in school. It's being suppressed under diversity and colorblindness. And so you don't know who you are 
as a black person. You don't know how to navigate. You don't know how to navigate this world as a black person, as a black child. Oh, now all you're going to try and do is fit in. You're just going to try and fit in, get in where you can. And the last thing you want to do is talk about race, and racism, and slavery, and all this other kind of shit. You don't want to talk about it. You don't have any sense of confidence in yourself. No, you don't have any sense of of of, of worth and value. Number one, because what you are presented with, it's it's very one dimensional. And number two, um, it's not even accurate. <laughs> it's not even accurate. And so uh, you end up you end up wanting, you know, seeking inclusion. You end up seeking white validation and approval because it's because let me tell you color and I talk about this in the, in another video, but color blindness and diversity and talks of equality discourage talk of systemic or systematic oppression. They like that's it's used to brush it under the rug like it doesn't exist. Right? And so black children are fed that in their minds that's talking about the past. Okay? And it is, but in their minds, it's something we should get over and not even talk about. Because now we're living in a different society and none of that has an effect. Even though <laughs> They are impacted by it. And um, so unfortunately, these children, they're just, they're going to, some, a lot of them, they're not going to, things are not really going to set in for them until shit hits the fan for them. And that's unfortunate. I didn't become conscious, conscious. That word is trying to become a bit of a cliche. Man, this so-called conscious community is, is, it's toe up. <laughs> toe up. Toe up, toe up, toe up. It's toe up. <laughs> I mean, it's nothing but bickering. It's nothing but people trying to uh, uh, tell you who to worship. I mean, it's just, I'm like, how y'all call yourselves Pan African? How y'all call yourselves conscious? How y'all do that? Because everything you do flies in the face <laughs> of Pan-Africanism, the tenets, the principles of Pan-Africanism. And the funny thing of it is, is that the majority of these people who wave the RBG flag, the red, black, and green flag, or even the other colors, um, the Ethiopian flag of Pan-Africanism, a lot of these people, they, um, they don't even know Marcus Garvey was, was um, Christian. How do I don't understand that? I don't care who you worship. That is not my concern. My only concern is the upliftment of black people. That's it. Economically, politically, etc. That, that's that, that is my only concern. Nothing else. You you want to sit up there and and worship Heru and all that other shit? Fine. <laughs> I don't care. That's not a problem for me. Because I'm solid in, 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 in who I am and what I know. And you'll find that the majority of people who, who, who rail against Christianity and who you serve and yada, 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 and blah, 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 they're the ones who have issues. <laughs> they're insecure in what they think they understand and know about their own set of beliefs. That's why they come at you. Real talk. You know what I'm saying? Real talk. Anyway, I'm going off subject like I always do. Sorry. <laughs> so getting back to how white people um, intentionally uh, present things in a very deceptive form so that you come away with a different take than you need to. So again, so if you're familiar with um, African history, and um, you know some of the process of slave catching and all that. 
you may or may not be familiar with the term Atlantic Creoles. Now, he's not going to tell you <laughs> who these people really are. Not in totality. He kind of skirts around it. And the way he frames how they came about is quite disturbing. Because you don't get the gravity of, um, you know, what took place. You know, they couch it in a certain way to where um, it's, it, it, it's not, you're not given the full scope of what happened. Right? You know, it's couched in sensitivity. You know, it's, cou you know, it's covered, covered up. And I'm assuming that's just to protect their feelings. Because black people already know we were treated like shit. So there's no point in covering up what really happened. The only reason why you would want to cover up the true nature of what happened is because you won't, you don't want to, you want to protect your feelings. You want to protect white people's feelings. That's all it is. Okay. So Atlantic Creos were children produced through rape. Now, look at this, this first little line. <laughs> The way he framed their, their, their coming about, their existence. Atlantic Creos traced their beginnings in the historic encounter of European and Africans on the west coast of Africa. <laughs> deceptive. That's very deceptive. And it's done intentionally, but it's, it's, that's deceptive. And this is what they do. That is what they do. Okay. Um, so anyway, these were buffer babies. I call them buffer babies. They play both sides of the fence. Okay. Black and white. And he goes into it right here. This little paragraph. Okay. They, they, um, they play both sides of the fence. These children, they were reared to um, be um, facilitators in the um, slave catching process. And this, you know, in selling, the selling process as well. Okay. Now they were used to maintain this, the system, the status quo, and get their own. All right. These were the people who were catching and selling this. Okay. These were the ones. All right. So just want to show you that. <laughs> um, another example of this. Is something called, and, and this is dealing with um, enslaved or enslaved ancestors in various regions. Remember when I talked about how certain um, how certain groups of blacks were taken to certain regions for particular purposes? Okay, this this is along those lines. Okay, kind of it's along those lines. Um, there's something called, um, there's an idea floating around. It's in the same book too, but it's a popular idea in uh, history. There's a popular idea, and um, it makes sense. Totally makes sense. They, the, the white Europeans, they splice information. Okay, they splice it <laughs> so they can um, utilize a technicality to their advantage. All right, there's something called uh, societies with slaves. Okay, and slave societies. All right. Now, the difference between the two is that um, slave societies, uh, their foundation, their government, their power, um, the way the state functioned, okay, how it was controlled, you know, what controlled it, the institution of slavery controlled all of that. So if you pulled out the institution of slavery from that particular state or region, it would collapse. Okay. Because everything depended on the institution of slavery. Okay. For it to maintain itself. Okay. That is a slave society. Okay. Now societies with slaves is just the opposite. Okay. The institution of slavery was not a central factor or a central um, player in the um, maintaining of that state. Does that make sense? So that state could 
function independently on its own if the institution of slavery was removed. Okay, the idea here, when you peel back the, the onion, the idea here is one, that slavery had less of an impact both on people and both on the development of America, okay? Two, the conditions, right, weren't as bad as the, that's what they would like you to believe, okay? Um, now, getting to the point about how slavery had less than an impact on the, on the development of America because it wasn't a slave society. Okay, that's bullshit. Because look, let's take somewhere like Pennsylvania. They were known for ironwork. Okay, now ironwork may not have been, you know, the, the, the commodity that controlled Pennsylvania. Or even, you know, so if you took out ironwork, uh, Pennsylvania back then may or may not have stood well on its own. Okay, but without iron, the ironwork, the workforce, you know, the black workforce, you know, we, we forged and shaped entire, I want to curse, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we shaped and forged entire industries. And those industries had an overall impact on the strengthening and the expansion and the maintenance of the white societal structure. All right white domination, capitalism, or the functioning, functioning of capitalism. Okay, entire industries that were shaped and forged by black Africans had an entire impact on the development of America and the modern world and the functioning of, functioning of capitalism, okay, and racism. Okay, that's the truth. I mean, there are people going around saying that Slavery in general didn't have an impact on the economic development of America. They are fucking, they are, they are out of their minds. It's crazy. It's denial. It's denial. And it, it just, <laughs> it's crazy. Sorry for cursing. But, and you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's nuts. So let me, um, I think I have a bit, I think I have a screenshot of it. Let me see. Um, okay. My mask is just stuck. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, yeah. Let me see if I can. Uh... Okay, here we go. Fuji's. I miss them. Yeah, I really do. <sighs> oh, well. oh, my cliff. <laughs> okay. Now. Hey, y'all. Uh, Lauren is, uh, she's good people. Real good people. She's good people. I, had a, uh, I was able to chop it up with her. Um, she came out here in LA. Uh, uh, okay, let me see. I'm trying to find. Uh, let me close this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> I'm trying to find the. Yeah. So here it is. Slaves with societies versus. Slave societies. All right. You can kind of read it if you want. I'll um. I'll kind of read it, I guess. Uh, let's see what I want to start. I guess I can start again. The economic significance of slavery also varies significantly within different English North American regions, which led to the contrasting legal structures, social hierarchies and labor experiences for enslaved Africans, while colonial societies in New England and Canada included enslaved Africans and American Indians. Scholars argue that these regions functioned as societies with slaves, where the institution of slavery was relatively peripheral to local economies and white social studies. So, well, that's bullshit right there. Uh, Northeastern colonies featured fewer plantations, and enslaved people often worked in domestic service or artisanal skills. Okay. In contrast, major plantation areas in southern colonies functioned as slave societies where slavery stood at the center of politics, the economy, labor experiences, and, and uh, social identities. Slaveholders made up the ruling class in these areas, and the master-slave relationship shaped aspects of society and daily life. Okay? 
no, since I already explained it, I don't need to explain it again. Okay? That's basically what it was. All right? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have to check. I'm, I'm checking this. We're good. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so, that's that. I just kind of wanted to point out to you how, um, how they operate, how they do, you know? You have to make sure you just be on your P's and Q's when it comes to that, because they're not honest. And if you have some that are honest, you know, it's, it's usually they're just trying to shake their guilt off. Yeah, you know, I have no problems reading uh, books and stuff by white people. None, none whatsoever. I also have no problem learning from them. So long as you don't go in there with the idea that none of them are non-racist. <laughs> you know, nice whites. Nice whites. And I put that in quotation marks. Seemingly nice whites. Okay. Are racist. Every last one of them. Every single one of them are racist. I know... And I say it all the time, but I know that seems harsh. And it could be for people, you know, for some folks who don't really understand what racism is, but it is what it is. All right. <laughs> um, you know, you can't go into college with an empty head. <laughs> and uh, that's what's happening. When I went to college, I was first going to become a lawyer, but uh, I decided not to. Um... And I went, into, I went into psychology and linguistics. I know, don't ask about the pairing, but I was very interested in learning about human behavior and why black folks do what they do, say what they say, act the way they act. I was already observing and psychology didn't help. <laughs> it just, whoa. Anyways, um, it definitely enhanced it. Um, and linguistics, I wanted to know why we talk the way we talk you know i wanted to know the history behind it what really happened on that thursday here at augusta high school that led to chris wood's death the fuck is that <laughs> Shit! i'm dying in this fucking country ass fucked up town <laughs> Shit flying in my mouth the fuck? I can't see pollen. Let's get the fuck out of this country, motherfucker. I can't even see me. What really happened on that Thursday here at Augusta High School that led to Chris Wood's death? So, you know, I had an interesting... I didn't go to college um, uh, with the intent of graduating and, and, and looking for a job. That's not why I went to college. You know, because what's pushed a lot of times in black households, go to college, get a job, go to college, get a job, go to college, get a, go get a job. And I understand that, but um, in the long term, that, you know, that's not, <laughs> that's not um, something that is actually beneficial to us in the long term. Look, look at where we are. A lot of black folks, with college degrees, and they can't—they can't find jobs. And and they don't understand that there are quotas for us, or maybe they maybe some of them are now just figuring figuring that out. But there are quotas for us, and so when you when you're raising children, number one, don't produce non-thinking. Non I'm thinking children okay try your best and I, and I know like I said a lot of black folks this is hard you know you know you're trying to keep your head above water and just survive I get it I really do I get it but try your best to counteract the bullshit that our children are fed in these schools because they are not producing thinkers they're not there's none of these kids are thinkers they're not thinkers and so You produce robotic children who just 
regurgitate stuff. And um, even even when I was growing up, it was like that. But I, I I'm very thankful. I'm, I, I, I wasn't I was exposed to um, teachers um, that place a heavy emphasis on thinking. <laughs> um, and I was always a reader anyway. You know, average reader. I'm a massive reader. I think that's very important. I know black folks were visual people. Uh, most of us were very visual, but you have to also read. Um, in some instances, I'm a multimodal learner, so whatever gear kicks in, depending upon the subject matter, that's the one I use for the most part. It's just it's a natural, um, it's a natural um, thing that happens. So even though I'm a multimodal learner, one gear kicks in for a particular subject. Anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. But I wasn't pushed to go to college. <laughs> You know, that was just the environment I was surrounded in. I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in life. Um, and I was like, okay, let me just go to college. <laughs> That's where my head was. I was like, okay, let me just go to college and see what's up. So I went to college, put myself through college, paid for it, everything. Um, where parents... If you have the money and you been you know and your child wants to go to college, pay for it, please. Please pay for it. That's not right. Don't do that. That wasn't my case, but if you have the means to pay for your children's college and they want to go to college, pay for it. Okay? Don't do that to them. It's very hard trying to pay for college. <laughs> pay for it. Okay. Okay, you can make them pay for their books and all that, okay? They can get a job doing it that way. Okay, but pay for their, you know, or if you want them to pay a little portion towards their tuition. Okay, I can understand that, but come on, don't do that to them. <laughs> the shit's not easy. <laughs> okay, it's not easy. Oh, man. And kids, if you're going to college, I know, I know kids probably listen to this, but if they're going to college, don't, don't do a whole lot in your first semester. Don't load yourself <laughs> with 18 units that's nuts don't do that take it easy you know mix some hard courses with some easy courses that you can kind of you know relax kind of you know relax yourself with and not have to worry about so much you know mix it up all right get all your general ed stuff out the way first and then move into your core subject that you're going to go into yeah I dabbled in quite a bit of stuff when I was in college in terms of subject matter. <laughs> okay. But anyway, um, I didn't go to college with the intent to get a job. That wasn't my intent. Uh, was it an expectation? Yes, but it wasn't my intent. Okay. I figured I'm doing all this goddamn work. I better get a job. <laughs> but it wasn't my intent. That wasn't the reason why I went there to learn. Um, and the scales fell off, the conditioning fell off. I was smart enough. When I was in high school, it was like one foot in, one foot out when it comes to being conscious. So I was kind of there, but not there, you know. Um, but when I went to went into college, the scales fell off. And as I continued to develop, it just, you know, it kept, they kept falling off. So it's a process. Becoming aware of what's being fed to you, becoming aware of the brainwashing machine that is programmed to start from birth <laughs> through college or through high school, okay? Uh, becoming aware of all of that. Um, if you don't have a household that is really set up to counteract that, it's going to be a process. Um, of really removing all of the damage. Couple that with the amount of generational trauma that we have as black people that we don't know that we have and we pass it on. So even in my family, you know, and, and you know, your family, you know, black families, period, it's just a lot of dysfunction. And um, I, you know, I, I talk quite a bit about, a, about it in uh, dealing with, um, pro-black sellouts, I, I, I talk about the conditioning that we've had that's become so embedded and ingrained in our, in our, in our, in our psyche, in our behavior, you know, it's become part of our genetics, it's, it's nuts, a lot of it, it's become part of our genetics, and 
it's become so ingrained in our brain that it becomes an unconscious manifestation. That's scary. So we don't know a lot of times why we do and say what we do. So it takes, you have to unravel that. Think about what you, you know, it's, it's called metacognition. You know, you're deconstructing your thought processes. How you think, why you think the way you think, how you behave, and why you behave the way you behave. You're, you're, you're digging underneath the behavior and getting to the root. And that's what we have to truly do before we can really move anywhere. This is why the so-called conscious community can, can't get anywhere because we've brought in so much damage from our oppression. And we're not willing to excavate the damage because it's painful and it's not easy to do. And so we're not willing to excavate the damage. And so, you know, we end up, unfortunately, repeating cycles of um, dysfunction that ends up actually maintaining our own subjugation because we can't get anywhere. And so you have to be able to build with people who have that level of understanding. Like, I can't build with a lot of black people who consider themselves conscious. And I'm thinking about even getting away from that word because it's becoming very cliche. Um, because I find that a lot of them are not as so-called conscious as they think they are. A lot of them got yeah, a lot of brothers in there who come in to recoup power. A lot of damaged sisters coming in, looking for love and, and for the wrong reasons, you know. And um, <laughs> it's terrible, 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 terrible. And they're using Pan Africanism as a crutch, as a crutch, a bandage. It's a bandage, and um, it's it's not really serving its purpose, and it's becoming a, a mockery, which is unfortunate, and it's, it's and that's a disservice to Marcus Garvey and other uh, other ancestors that were Pan Africanists. It's a disservice to them, and it's a disgrace, and it's very sad, very disconcerting. So I can't build with a lot of black people. Um, And it's sad. I have a few that I'm working with. I got some stuff coming down the pipeline. Y'all. I don't care how long it's going to take me. I am committed. <laughs> I'm committed to playing a part in restructuring our condition. Point blank period. I don't get, I don't care how long it takes me. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't care how long it takes me. It's going to happen. So that is my passion. Like I'm the kind of person where like I cannot, I can't have a job and just to have one. You know, what I do has to have purpose, meaning. Otherwise, I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not happy, you know, or satisfied. My, my, what I do has to have purpose. It has to have meaning. It has to... You know, you know, it, it just, it has to, it has to, you know, I can't live like that and just have a job. Some people can, some people can, some people can, but then I wonder, you know, I, I don't understand how people do that. I don't, I guess if you have to, you have to, you know, but you know, I have, you know, what I do has to have purpose and you know, maybe that whatever they're working in, whatever job they have. Maybe, you know, it has some intrinsic value to them that is purposeful, okay? So, you know, it doesn't always have to be grand scale, you know. Your purpose doesn't always have to be grand scale. You might find simple satisfaction in, you know, a job, whatever your job is, okay? But 
anyway, but when you go to college, you know, when you when you send your children off to college, don't send them in looking for a job. Send them in to get that degree, learn all they can. Don't send them in with the empty head just to, you know, pick up information and regurgitate shit, you know, build their character up to where they're able to challenge information and, you know, they have good values, good good moral <coughs> values, you know, just, you know, raise them to be good people, good people where they love themselves, they love their people, you know, things like that, okay? And uh, they have a dedication and commitment to their own, you know, and um, so you send them in with that foundation, okay? You send them in with that foundation and you tell them, you explain to them, you go in with the intention of learning but also coming back and building or helping to you know reconfigure the condition of your people you know you don't go in there looking to maintain the system by by looking for a job working for white people no don't get me wrong what we're what we're dealing with here now as a whole is going to take time to unravel to undo you know and to reestablish in terms of our independence as a people. That's going to take time. So I get people, you know, looking for jobs after they come out of college. I totally get that. I understand that. But when you have a child who's been reared a certain way and they understand what they need to do, they're going to eventually pull themselves out of that equation and look for ways to establish themselves within the community. Now, they, not, they might not necessarily be entrepreneurs, but they might have something else to offer. Okay? All right, and everybody, you know, okay? So I just kind of wanted to get that out there. Um, okay, so now we're going to get to the main part, <laughs> which is the migration patterns. Uh, I'm going to use an interactive map, which I thought was pretty interactive, but it's, it's, I mean, it's okay. I thought it'd be better. Um, you know, where I could shade in regions and things like that, but it didn't, uh, it's not really like that, but it'll do for what I need it to do. Okay. It'll do. Uh, let me find the, um, <clears throat> map real quick. Okay. All right, what we're going to talk about deals with um, migration patterns. And it's important to understand migration patterns because if it, 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 um, it provides a solid base for um, slavery. Okay, you'll see why, but I'm just gonna begin with the migration pattern. Why people didn't develop until, and I say develop for a reason, until about 6,000 years ago i'll give i'll add on i'll tack on a couple of thousand years so six to eight thousand years ago okay that's about four thousand bc being the latest point of development and six thousand bc being the earliest point of development okay so six to eight thousand years ago white folks developed in central asia okay six thousand to eight thousand years ago Okay. Now we have four migrations. Okay. Two migrations come out of Africa into Asia. And then we have another two migrations. Okay. Coming from Asia. I believe the fourth wave of migration strictly came from Australia to South America. And you'll understand what I mean when I, when, when I start to um, get into the subject matter. All right. The first wave started in Africa. I'm just going to make a point uh, on the map here. So 70,000 years ago, okay, black folks moved into India. Okay. And then they moved into Southeast Asia, India, which is Thailand, Vietnam, things like that. Okay, so 70,000 years ago, black folks moved into India. Okay, and then 
some of them moved into Southeast Asia. Okay, that is the first wave. Now, <clears throat> within this first wave, you had another group. Um, about 20,000 years later, which is, which is about 50,000 years ago, who moved to Australia. Okay. They moved to Australia. This is not the second wave. Okay. This is still the first wave, but it's just a branch, uh, that fell out that, that broke off. Okay. So. All right. I'm assuming they came from Africa to Australia. They could have come from here, but I, I mean, I, I doubt it. I think they came directly from here. Okay. Now the second wave, a little bit after 50,000 years ago. Okay. So a little bit after 50,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago is when they hit Australia and a little bit after that, some time after that, they moved to, um, the middle East, even though there is no such thing as the middle East. And then they moved into South and Central Asia, which is about right here, um, near Ka um, Kazakhstan, which is this place here. Okay. And then they moved into Northern Asia. Now, how many of y'all thought Russia was in Europe? I mean, some people will think that because they're white and I can understand. Oh, Russia is in Asia. And then after Russia and they moved to Europe, particularly like Rome and, and, and Paris and things like that. Okay. I'm just going to move a point here. All right. So this is the first wave. This is the second wave. Okay. The third wave, you had a group of black folks. Oh, by the way, we reached Europe about 35,000 years ago. Okay. The, um, third wave, um, they come from Asia, I don't know in particular where, but, and moved eastward. So that's China, Mongolia, Korea, Japan, <clears throat> places like that, okay? So I'm just going to put something here and just put it like up here, okay? So that's the third wave. Now, remember this uh, fourth wave. Um, I'm sorry, one second. This fourth wave, like... I'm just going to say they moved from Australia to um, South America. That makes more sense. Okay. So this fourth wave moved to South America. Okay. That's the fourth wave. And that was... The third wave here, which is right here, was about 20,000 years ago, right here, when they moved eastward into uh, China and everything. And this fourth wave was about 15,000 years ago, okay? And that's about right, because they find skeletal evidence of um, a black woman who they term uh, an Australoid, um, <laughs> trying to remove um, Africa from black Aborigines. And they will tell you where they came from, which is Africa. But anyway. So they came, they, uh, they, a black woman came from Australia or a, a black group came from Australia and moved into South America. Okay. About 15,000 years ago. Now, at this time, all of these folks, all of them, they were all black, okay? We don't see the development of Europeans or who we call Europeans um, until um, 6,000 years ago, six to 8,000 years ago, which is about 4,000 BC to 6,000 BC, okay? So they develop here, okay? And for whatever reason, we don't know why, but they move into Europe at about 1500 BC, 15 to 1200 BC, they move into Europe. Okay. This is called the Kurgan hypothesis. Okay. This is more of a linguistically based hypothesis for the Proto-Indo-European language. And it's a, um, um, it has a genetic relationship, uh, with Central Asia. Genetic doesn't, and linguistics doesn't mean, um, DNA. It just means there is a relationship, um, 
that traces back to this origin for the language, even though uh, it's mostly here. Okay, um, but there is a gen there there is a and there is an actual genetic basis. Okay, for white being Asians, Central Asians. Okay, uh, so the Kurgan hypothesis. Um, now you're gonna have white scientists who um, suggest that we moved into Europe. Uh, through Africa or, or, or via Africa, which is not true. We moved from Africa to Central Asia, okay, and whites didn't develop, okay, until six to eight thousand years ago, and they are the ones, okay, who moved to Europe through Asia, okay, via Asia, all right. They did not come from Africa and move into Europe. White folks did not do that. Okay. Um, by the way, Europe is not a continent. If y'all didn't know, <laughs> they lied like they do everything else. <laughs> it's a peninsula. That's what it is. Okay. That's what it is. It's on the Asian continent. <laughs> it's a peninsula. It's not, um, it's not a continent. <laughs> but anyways, so the first migration of whites to Europe, again, was about 1500 BC to 1200 BC. Nobody knows why, okay? Particularly Rome. Now, blacks were already here, okay? So they got absorbed into uh, the culture and the civiliz civilization there, all right? Um, so it became a bit of a mixed population, Okay. And at about 1200 BC or so, you have your Dark Age in Greece. Uh, I don't know what happened, but I think the blacks, the blacks just kind of left. <laughs> and, you know, they left a lot. Um, you don't really know too much information um, outside of your, your, your traditional places like uh, Rome and, and Paris and... Uh, London and the UK up to an extent uh, what else um, Greece you know places like that you don't know too you know outside of them you don't really know a lot about Europe you know and I've been looking for a compendium um, on European history and I think I found it but I'm not really sure if it's exactly what I want but I think it's a good start you know I mean that's a bit of a task to do that's a great big task I don't know shit about Poland or anything like that. Germany, I know a little bit about. I know some things about Ireland and Scotland to an extent, ancient stuff. Um, but you don't know a whole lot of, about the region. So, you know, European history is very interesting. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not enough. It's not sufficient enough uh, just to know about black African history. You have to know about their history too. Because then you you begin to see some patterns, okay? <laughs> they have a very interesting collective psyche. <laughs> Anyways, so we don't we don't get uh, uh, yeah, so we don't get the first uh, migration of whites into Europe until about fifteen hundred or twelve hundred BC. They get absorbed into the culture that, that blacks already um, started and developed, which started in the Minoan civilization, the Crete civilization. Which is, I want to say, right here. Okay, here's Crete. Right here. Minoan civilization, black folks. Okay, and it moved into Greece, okay? 
click on them. All right. Um, and then the black folks, I don't know, they just left. <laughs> and then <laughs> at around like uh, 1100 BC or, some, or something like that to about 800 BC, I think I'm off maybe about 50 years or so, everything stops. So they're living in squalor and they have a, a lot of diseases and it's just really disgusting. Okay, so then the second wave of migration to Europe from Central Asia comes from the invasion of the Huns from Mongolia. So you got these Huns traveling here, traveling across here, and then they're invading Central Asia. And then they ran the, they run a lot of the whites out, and the whites move into Europe. This is to be the second. Uh, wave. There were three waves of, of, of um, migration to Europe by whites. Okay, so the second wave was caused by the first invasion into Central Asia by the Huns. The third wave of migration um, into Europe from Central Asia uh, comes from the second invasion <laughs> by the Huns into Central Asia. Okay, okay, and what's funny about that? And this the, and this was AD time. Okay, like 500 AD or something like that. What's interesting about this is the Huns, they end up hitting up Europe anyway. So, me that. <laughs> so, I just kind of wanted to put that out there. You know? I don't know when I'm going to upload this. I may or may not upload this after. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I uh, might wait. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know. I haven't really decided. But, um, that's pretty much it. You see how they do, see, they, they like to try and include Egypt as Middle East, even though it sits on the African uh, plate. They, they are willing to take a chunk, <laughs> a chunk out of Africa. That's crazy. By the way, the Suez Canal is man-made. So they built a canal here to uh, separate the rest of uh, the Middle East. So far, Middle East. So, um, that's pretty much it. That is pretty much it. Okay? Alright, y'all. Bye.
see that boss like construction right there, man. Look at that. We buying the hood, man. Building something nice in the hood. You know? That's what I'm talking about right there, man. If you love your hood, buy your hood. Take care of your hood. Uh, talking about nice. Boss like construction. In the hood, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, look at us. Boss like construction. We building black businesses in the hood. You know what I'm talking about? Irish Burger Shack coming soon. Chosen people Bible in my hand Word inside my heart And pain before my eyes Broken people Wanting to believe in something Looking for a light Trying to find the truth But we give them doubt saying we do something we don't Hurting people saying we do things that we won't Wolfing sheets clothing with a cross on his chest Taking people money promising to be blessed But power to the chosen people Who at one point wasn't viewed as an equal His own chosen people Royal priesthood yeah. Yeah, That you've been called out of the darkness Into the marvelous light Do you know who you are? My brother, would you be out there risking your life for green paper? If you knew you had it all already, if you knew you were a king, well, the best I can offer is to tell you the truth. Mercy changed everything for me and you, but they don't really tell us what we do need to know. But first, Peter 2 and 6 a pleasure for sure. So, power to the chosen people who at one point wasn't viewed as an equal. His own chosen people, a royal priesthood hey. Said that you were called out of the door Into the marvelous light oh, uh, Do you know who you are? Chosen people, royal priesthood. 